Taking a breath in. And here we are. One more breath, grounding ourselves, welcoming in our viewers at home. Oh, and here we are. So today we're actually going to be talking about the ninth final tenet of Living Peace, which is Release Self. But for those of you who have not listened to the previous recordings, that is okay because no matter where you're coming in at in these sermons, they're gonna still, there's still going to be nuggets of information for you. Granted, as you go along, if you listen to them consistently, you will see how they kind of build off of the ladder. But of course, none of it beats actually reading the book from back to cover because for these sermons, sometimes I go off on little tangents. <laughs> And I always like to put a fun spin on it each time so it's just not the same content all over again. Um, so we always use it as the foundation from which to grow upon, but I've always liked to bring in other aspects that help our learning and growth. So let's take a breath. So it's important to recognize that in these final three teachings, which uh, or the final bracket of three teachings is release our attachment to the mundane world, release our attachment to what we think we know, and release our attachment to who we think we are. So of course today is release self, but it's always nice, uh, it's always a nice reminder to recognize that these final three teachings, it's not so much release mundane, release knowing, release self, it's releasing attachment to X, Y, Z. And so showing up in life you know sometimes people get the misinterpretation that we're completely letting go of all physicality such as in the mundane we're releasing all of our attachment we're just going to sell everything and just live as a monk with nothing and yes you can do that and that's okay but it's not so much about releasing all of our attachments all of our relationships all of our knowledge per se it is more about the the parts of it that are causing us suffering and so really think about that. If I'm attached to the, such as maybe I have a lot of things or I have a little things, but if whatever I have in my life are, um, I'm so afraid to lose them, that is the attachment that is causing us suffering. Or maybe we're in a relationship where we have family members. I've worked a lot of, with people over the years who are a very much afraid of mortality. And then they, even though their, their child is perfectly fine, all they could think about on a daily basis is, oh my God, what if something happened to them? And so that is the attachment that is causing, a mental attachment that is perpetually causing suffering within themselves. And so that is the attachment that we're looking to disconnect from. And then of course the releasing of self is our attachment to this identity. And so for those of you, actually, I think we talked, it wasn't last Sunday we talked about it, but it was during the workshop last Saturday that we talked about it. We actually had, um, actually, let me grab this. Do you mind real quick finding the release self chapter for me? I'm going to read it. We actually had uh, the individual who just got ordained as uh, Dun Chie uh, this last Sunday with us that I read the section from the book where her homework, her quiz, was to release her attachment to being a woman. Because I will go ahead and share that real quick. <laughs> Perfect. No longer a woman. Another example of release self that I gave one of my students as homework was to release identity, identifying as a woman. She was a strong older woman who grew up fighting tooth and nail to get her piece of pie when America was predominantly male focused, especially in the workforce. As a single mom, she raised her son for herself through college and became a nurse practitioner. Her story is very inspiring. Yet years later, she still harbored resentment over the way our society continues to perpetuate the male-female divide. It often amused me how, in nearly every session, she skillfully tied her identity as a woman into the conversation. This is for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Always tied it back to the conversation by making a comment or rant about how hard it was and sometimes still is. One day I pointed this pattern out to her and gave her the homework of releasing being a woman for a couple weeks just to see what might happen. When she came back, her entire demeanor had changed and she was so much more relaxed. We both concluded that this releasing didn't negate her hardship or the continued hardship of women around the world. What it did was help her maintain her peace to, and stop identifying with herself in collected experiences. Now she can describe the struggles of female inequality from a place of peace and precise communication, whereas before her fiery rants may have caused the people she was trying to reach to tune her out. Note 
Oh, I don't need to go anymore. But moral of the story there is that it was not so much releasing being a woman, it was releasing the attachment and the story of being a woman and how hard it was. And again, it doesn't negate the hardship or the bullshit that is still going on. What it does is it creates an inner peace within the self so that we can then actually fully show up in the world and come at it from a place of peaceful unity and uh, commun uh, community and conversation rather than instantly getting pissed off because when you come at and trying to heal things from a place of pissed offness, I'm sure all of you can relate to this, it doesn't always work out as you expected because when we come at it from that fiery place, what ends up happening is the other person either gets defensive or offensive or just tunes us out completely. But when we can actually maintain our equilibrium, it's so much more effective at building bridges of understanding. And so that's the flip side of it. The yin, the passive side of it, was she was able to actually finally heal that part of her. But then the yang, the, the active side of it, was how she was showing up in conversations. So I love putting that in the book. So if you're listening, thank you. Um, because it's just a perfect example of what it really means to finally get into this last tenet of really any identifying factors we have within ourselves that we're holding on to that is still causing us an, uh, an imbalance, an emotional reaction, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go ahead and take a breath in. So that was just kind of a fun introduction. Didn't know I was sharing that today, but nonetheless, it was beautiful. So today I actually, for those of you who have your little handout, um, I have three keynotes at the bottom that we're going to kind of work through, and then I'll be reading a couple excerpts from Living Peace that I also have in the handout. And so I'm going to actually start backwards. So the last one is unconditional love and the relinquishment of self. Fun fact, until you fully release yourself, you can't unconditionally love. And that might be new information to some of you. <laughs> I see some, oh! <laughs> And maybe it's not fully releasing yourself, and maybe it's more of just a releasing of uh, self in a certain relationship, and that might work. But really think about it. Really think about it. As long as you're really attached to what you're getting out of it, you're going to be triggered by the other person, aren't you? <laughs> Think about anyone in your life that you love dearly and how they probably piss you off from time to time. And what's fascinating, it is the, the closer the relationship generally has more triggers attached to it because you have all these identities attached with it as well. And so it's kind of, it could be like mother and daughter. It can be, you know, it could be me and my parents. It could be me and my spouse. You know, now, I, now I'm married to this guy. And husband has a lot of expectations placed upon it. When you're just dating, it's a very different animal of expectation. But the moment, you know, that's where people always come to me. They're just like, I married this person. But the moment we got married, they changed. Because the moment you get married and you add a new label on it, all of a sudden, there, it changes something in the psychology of the mind. Which, for, which fortunately, if you do this work, you kind of get that out of the way before you get married. So we didn't have that same experience. But it's so interesting how depending on the identities that we place upon ourselves and the other people, identity always comes with expectation of how someone should be behaving, how you should be behaving, the emotions involved, the give, the take, and the everything in between. And <clears throat> unfortunately, that is just a major, huge cause of suffering. And so when we're able to kind of step out of those roles, and we release those attachments, we're actually able to fully show up in those conversations and really get to the heart of matters and conflict rather than getting so caught up in the, the offense and the defense. And I love that in my relationship because even if my mom was here, she's still in cattle corn at the moment, but if my parents were here today, you know, I would call on my mom and ask her to share how there have been times in our relationship where I actually was not her son. I was not her child. I actually came, kind of came at it. I was in that moment the teacher. And so I was able to put my own identity of uh, son and she was able to put my identity of son and her identity as mom aside. And we were able to have this really beautiful conversation um, and I would say this is even possible if you're not a teacher, if you're not a life coach, anyone can kind of put it to the side and just show up and have a heart to heart conversation. But it's so difficult to do that. And I always recommend people if you're going to try and have a conversation neutrality with someone, disclaim it up front, you know, kind of set the groundwork and say, I know in this situation, you know, you're my child and I'm your mom. 
but let's, there's so much expectation and pressure with that. So let's go ahead and just sit down and take some deep breaths and put that to the side momentarily and just tell me what's hurting you. And I'll tell you what's hurting me. And so when you come at it from that place of compassion and from that place of zero expectation and just having a conversation almost with strangers, because who's, who's been able to have a conversation with a stranger before and it's so much easier to just kind of let it all hang out because there's no expectation involved. You don't know who the fuck the person is. <laughs> and so it's so funny that we're so conditional in the way that we show up in our relationships because of the identities that we attach them to. And sometimes the identity can also be qualities within ourselves. Oh, I'm a terrible public speaker, we might say. Oh, I get so anxious around a certain thing. Oh, I'm not good at that. Or yeah, I'm great at this over here. And so we get, or maybe I have this, this illness that I've had for so long, or I've had this mental, mental craziness within me that I just really can't be present. I can't meditate. Or just all of these things that we attach to our own qualities within ourselves that actually keep us from fully showing up and doing the work. But in actuality, it may have been that way for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but if it's something, not everything, but many things, if it's something that we do want to work on and improve, that is something that we can release that identity of and really begin to show up for. Fun example is that the first time I ever taught line dancing, I bombed. It was so, so, so not great. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. And it was, I just, I bit off more than I can chew. I taught a really hard line dance. I had the microphone and I was out of breath. So my microphone kept going like this. And then you couldn't hear me on the speakers. I had like five people only showed up. And then by the end of it, only like two people were still there. And the whole bar was just staring at me and just like, oh my God, what is this guy doing? It was so embarrassing. And so in that moment, I just kind of decided I made it my identity of like, I'm not good at teaching line dancing and I never want to do this again. Well, then we moved here and there's no freaking line dancing around. And so I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to wait for someone else to do it. So I guess I'll go ahead and teach it. But fun fact, I was supposed to start in January, but I think subconsciously I made myself hurt. <laughs> because I literally, something happened with my knee where it caused so, something just popped out of place. And I could barely walk for a while. It was really, really painful. And so I had to delay it a month. And I'm like, well, isn't this convenient? <laughs> Obviously, consciously, I wasn't thinking, ooh, hurt myself, hurt myself, hurt myself. But in, in actuality, what ended up happening, I did manifest this random physical element, and then it pushed it back a month until I was ready to show up again because I had so much anxiety that first month. But then when we showed up for the second month, the anxiety was pretty much gone. And it was a fantastic, fantastic turnout. And we had such a fun time. I actually did a great job. And now it's turned into every month I've been teaching ever since. And now I'm putting to now put together a team and we performed at a freaking block party. So it's so <laughs> funny how one thing can go awry. And if we keep beating that drum and making it part of our identity and our belief system, then it really keeps us from actually getting outside of our comfort zone and trying anything else. But because I understood the teachings, I just said, you know what? Yes, that happened. But just because that happened, I'm not going to let it become necessarily part of my identity. And so I'm going to keep working on it, even though I had that fun little month of like making myself ill <laughs> because of that. I'm sure and it, you, kids can do it too. I'm sure some of you, when they have a test, all of a sudden they magically get sick. <laughs> It is crazy. And some of us may have even done that as adults with interviews or maybe dates or just something really important coming up that we, that we can really manifest um, and create for ourselves something that blocks the experience from happening. It is so fascinating. So anyway, let's take a breath. That was just a fun little side tangent there. So what I actually had written down was, even though this is about releasing self, I wanted to actually talk about myself a little bit so you can get a better understanding of how this has applied. Because I know for me in college and in school and any training situation, I always learned a lot from the teacher's um, own personal examples. I never gave a shit what they're actually talking about half the time. I was always fascinated how what they're doing in their life and how they're achieving happiness. Because in math, I was not great at math. I'll just say that. I was a great student, but when it came to math, I always loved it when the teacher would just go off on rants about her relationships. I'm just like, yes, tell me more. Not so much for the gossip, but because they were happy. And I was fascinated how they're actually living a happy life. And so 
it was always interesting to me when teachers would really share maybe if they were in such as in history or a teacher when they would share personal examples of their life and how they actually achieved equilibrium and so that's kind of how i sometimes like to approach teaching i don't always do it but today i will so unconditional love and the relinquish relinquishment of self so there have been three things i realized i contemplated this last night that have caused me immense pain in my life that has then led to actually loving people consistently. And the three of them kind of go with this work that I do. And the first one is the rotating door, um, the open family rotating door. And so being a pastor is a very unique experience because you meet so many people. And unlike in other jobs where you meet a lot of people and the people that you meet in being a pastor, you open your heart to every single one of them and eventually you really love them as family. But because of the nature of this work, people show up and then they leave. <laughs> then they show up and then they leave, and then they show up and then they leave. And so I probably had my heart broken, not maybe not a hundred times, but dozens of times just by loving people so much and giving so much of myself in a pastoral role that then you just, you, they disappear and you never know what the hell happened. And then there's the psychology that occurs where it just really hurts because you put so much into that relationship. You bared your soul to them. They bared their soul to you. But nonetheless, part of this work is that people come and give what they want. Some of them stick around. So as you saw this last Saturday, uh, June Shea Emma has pretty much been with me from the beginning and that's beautiful. But there have been a lot of people along the way that it's like a rotating door. They come in and then they go out. And so as a pastor, I had to get very comfortable with the breaking of my heart. And I would say my heart's been broken more from not romantic relationships because most people hearts are broken by romantic relations with their family members. For me, it's literally just the people that I joyously get to interact with with this work. So I had to learn to get really comfortable with dropping all expectation of any time I meet someone and any time a new family joins the community and then whatever happens, you don't see them. It's already even happened here and there's no judgment involved, but I had to get comfortable by keeping myself open because the alternative would be closing myself off. And so every one who comes through that door, I'm just like, just kind of button this up a little bit more. <laughs> no one gets to in here, <laughs> you know, because whose heart's been broken before and the initial reaction is, well, let's just harden it. <laughs> I don't want to feel that way ever again. Can't do that in this field of work. And then the next part of it is the mirror effect. So, and this comes from more being a Zen teacher. And so the mirror effect is that when you get close with students over time, eventually it normally happens to every single student. And I realized this over the years, but some students are really effective at noticing it and they're just letting it go, but other students get consumed by it. And so when you're a Zen teacher, you eventually become the monster because you're helping people heal their core wounds. And every single student, it has happened every single time, we eventually get to their core wound. And the moment I touch it or poke at it or point it out, all of a sudden I become the quote bad guy. Because when, when you're the Zen teacher and you point it out and the student, sometimes it doesn't even happen. It just, it happens organically. It's not always an intentional thing. It just pops out of the blue and you're just like, well, I guess it's time for that. Did not know it was time for this, but here it is now and now we have to deal with it. 50% of the time, students will say, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm so excited to work on this. Other 50% of the time, the student is still in denial, and then they get really pissed off, and then you never see them again. And that is just the nature of this work that I've had to learn to accept that not everyone is ready to really heal those core wounds because it hurts too much. And the worst part of it, too, is sometimes I am part of their core wound. Just like every single one of you in this room has been in a relationship, most likely, where the relationship was <laughs> you each triggered each other's core wounds from life. And even we've had to work on that. And it, it generally happens in any form of relationship. And in a, a Zen teacher and Zen student relationship is also a very intimate, loving relationship. And so chances are, due to attraction and all that fun stuff, law of attraction, not physical attraction, that comes together, generally you're going to find the best teacher for you that will eventually kind of poke that thing and help you wake up from it. 
But again, not everyone is ready for that. And so I had to really accept being this mirror for people and recognize that, you know, pe some people are going to get really pissed off by me and they're not going to like me. They're going to say these awful things, but it's natural part of this work. It doesn't happen uh, that much anymore in a sense where it goes south <laughs> instead of continuing north because I become more effective at like managing it. But early on when I started this work, it was incredibly painful because again, that rotating door effect was happening. And then number three is empathy. I think many of, the, many of you in this room probably also have that gift where you feel other people's pain and it's just fantastic. <laughs> so when I started doing this work, I was, uh, I started before, I started life coaching and Reiki healing around the same time, but I really picked up a lot of clients first for Reiki healing because I wasn't pushing the life coaching as much. And so I would have people on a massage, massage table and I would do hands-on healing. And then I also taught a lot of Reiki and it was a really beautiful thing. But because of the nature of my own little empathy, fun stuff going on, no matter how much of the clear vessel I would do, because you're never healing people with your own energy, you're kind of just being holding space and allowing the whatever to come through. I would always pick up their physical elements and then I would carry them in my body so much so that my back eventually went out because every time after every session and any time I would do healing circles and facilitate, it always caused me so much physical pain, so much so where I couldn't walk and I was 22. What the hell? It was really, really weird. And uh, I talked about this last week during the workshop, but Dunshi Emma remembers when I came in with a cane. And it was just the funniest sight. I was in so much pain, but the whole congregation was just laughing their ass off because here's this like young guy that's like, you know, he's looks like he's 80 with a cane and he can barely move his back from doing too much healing work. And so that was coming from the empathy. And I can reflect back to a child where I couldn't even shake certain people's hands. I was always forced to. Don't force kids to shake people's hands because if they're empathetic, they can feel the pain. So what I was doing is anytime I would shake someone's hand and I didn't want to, I would actually feel their unresolved karma. I would feel their unresolved emotional baggage. And it felt really weird as an eight-year-old shaking someone's hand and then getting it into my system. And then I would shut down for a while, not knowing how to process it. But now as an adult, I'm able to. So those three things make up how much uh, wonderful uh, holding space of pain that I've gone through in this field of work. So the rotating door of being a pastor and falling in love with everyone who walks through that door, but then also being comfortable whenever they leave without having a story. And then the, of course, <clears throat> the mirror effect of being that mirror for people's unresolved karma and wounds that they then project upon. And then some of them say, yes, let's work on it. Some of them say no too much and they back away. And then of course the empathy of actually feeling the physical pain that a lot of individuals are going through and then carrying it in the body. Don't have that issue anymore, by the way, I was able to figure that out. But the last, the, the first two of the rotating door and the mirror effect really allowed me as a, an, as a child and a teen and then now an adult to be able to experience the, the heartbreak that comes from living this life. And what's beautiful is that even though many people would judge me as not going through much pain in their life because they say, oh, look, you know, you've had a good time. You've all these things. You've been able to do your job from a young age and you had nice parents growing up. You didn't suffer incredible abuse, but nonetheless, it allowed me to hold space for all these people and community. And so what I ended up doing with all the physical pain and the emotional pain and the mental pain that was, a, that was arising is I was able to turn that into unconditional love. I was able to transform that into unconditional compassion because when you're able, and I think every single one of you in this room has felt a lot of pain in your lives at some point or another, but what happens is that most of us harden from it, don't we? And so my invitation to all of you is to do kind of what I ended up doing is fully recognize that all of this pain that you've been feeling in your life, no matter what source it comes from, is actually your greatest source of, uh, it is your greatest gift. It is your greatest source of inspiration if you allow it to touch your heart. And so a lot of us, anytime we feel pain, what happens is, again, we back away from it rather than lean into it. And then our lives don't get better. <laughs> really think about that. Every time you've really backed away from pain and every time you've really closed yourself off from the world or from other people, sure, you may have not been been in a very hurtful situation, you kind of got yourself out of it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that 
the pain fully went away because it's still there emotionally, it's still there mentally, and it just kind of keeps perpetuating forward. But when we start to kind of open ourselves up to the world and we allow ourselves to be tickled and our hearts be fully touched by pain, by grief, by suffering, what happens is it almost annihilates our heart. And that's a very scary thing to say, but it kind of just, it, it breaks it down to its most fundamental form. But once it's completely broken, what ends up happening is we realize that there's nothing left to fear anymore. And that's kind of what I took into Colorado moving here and saying, you know what? <laughs> so sick of suffering. <laughs> I'm so sick of like connecting with so many people and then they go this way and then that way and then this way and then that way and then watching them still suffer and all these things that, I could have just completely shut down and say, no more. I don't want to do this work anymore. But instead I said, I'm okay with being hurt. I'm okay with loss. I'm okay with pain. And by being, becoming okay with that pain, that's where joy starts to come from. And that's the paradoxical nature of this universe is that once you become very okay with pain and very okay with the suffering of the world, you actually are then able to show up and fully see people. Because before, if you're not okay with it, anytime you see someone in pain, you get uncomfortable. You fall into pity. You fall into fix-it mode. But when you're in fix-it mode, you're not listening to them. <laughs> Anyone ever try to fix your emotional problems or your tall and friend, then instantly they say, well, you need to do this, blah, 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 you know, X, Y, Z, I'm trying to help you. And then you're just like, I don't feel heard right now. <laughs> We, we do that to people constantly. We're not listening to other people. We're instantly in savior mode or we're instantly in pity mode or we're just so uncomfortable where we turn off the TV and we don't even want to listen to the world's problems anymore. And so we just, again, we just isolate, isolate, isolate. But our job in release self is to open, 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 open. Because when you're able to fully release that attachment to the identity that life should be one way or another way or whatever, I shouldn't have to deal with hurt. I shouldn't have to deal with pain. You know, I don't like having to deal with this or people should be treating me better or whatever the story is. It doesn't matter what the story is. We just inherently become okay with it. And the moment I became okay with being that mirror, the moment I became okay with the rotating door of being a community pastor, the moment I became okay with, it's like, well, empathy allows me to interact more effectively in life coaching. And people tell me what's going on. I have this unique ability to kind of zone in on the root core issue. And then it gets, it, it's much easier to get to the root problem because of the empathetic gift. <sighs> the suffering goes away. Pain is still there but the suffering itself goes away. And that is kind of what we're working on with the nine teachings is we begin to master our thoughts, the first one. We begin to master our thoughts in the way that we're perceiving and interacting. Then we begin to master our impulses. Are we reacting to life? Or are we responding to life? Then our emotions, the third one, mastery of emotion. Emotions are just information. So when you're angry, it's just information. When you're in grief, it's just information. When you're feeling any negative or positive emotion, it's just information to say, hey, pay attention to this. Something's going on. But normally we react and then we just kind of escalate it and we don't have the self-awareness enough to say, huh, this is here for a beautiful reason and let's figure that out. And then we have the three illusions, ignorance, chaos, and duality, the three illusions, followed by, they're also followed by the understandings of it. So ignorance is illusion, we seek understanding. Chaos is an illusion, we seek harmony. Duality is an illusion, we seek transcendence. So with ignorance, to get ourselves out of our own ignorance, we end up just developing a gentle curiosity towards life. So anytime someone's suffering, we just develop a gentle curiosity and we hold space and we ask questions. We have compassion and acceptance of it rather than getting into our strong opinions of what we think is right or wrong with them and saying, you need to do X, Y, Z to heal yourself. That doesn't help them. But when you fully, when they actually have someone in the first time in their whole existence, listening to them without a judgment, that is healing. Two, the chaos is illusion. Who is sometimes a firecracker? <laughs> <laughs> chaotic energy, not healing energy, not harmonizing energy. And so that's what we learn to shift chaos into harmonizing effect. And so we say chaos is an illusion in the sense where it's an illusion because we create it. It's not inherently there. It's not inherently in nature. Yes, volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, it may seem chaotic, but it's actually <laughs> in balance with the way this world was designed. 
when we're out there standing at it and yelling at the hurricane to stop, that's our own chaos adding into it, adding into it that then just leads to further conflict. I always like that one uh, meme that goes around social media where it's like, my house is in the middle of the path of like a constant hurricane. We will rebuild. And so just that constant idea of resisting, 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 rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to live somewhere else where it, there's not this constant destruction. And again, you know, that's the attachment though. You know, for generations, my family have lived on this land and I don't want to give it up. I don't want to lose it, even though I'm constantly going through pain by having to worry about, well, next year, another hurricane strike. Oh, an, an interesting example, but it's a good example because all of you in this room have maybe have had a relationship where you've said, well, I've already put 10 or 20 or 30 years into it. Maybe you know someone who's been in the situation. I don't want to lose that because I've worked so fucking hard to get to this point, even though it's been hard and, you know, there's been issues all along the way, you know, if I give up now, then what's the point? Well, the point is you can actually have peace. You know, maybe that relationship was only meant to last for a certain amount of years and it, it's not, it doesn't have, but the expectation is, well, marriage is forever. Not necessarily. But we have that idea. So it's kind of like, well, for generations we've been in this land and for decades I've been in this relationship. I want to hold on and make it work. But that resistance creates further chaos in our lives that causes disharmony. And so we learn to let that go. And then, of course, we have duality as an illusion, which we get caught up in morality. Oh, bless, bless human souls. People are so caught up in this moralistic thinking of good good, bad, right, wrong, and they think that morality helps them become a better person. But often what morality does, it just makes you feel awful about yourself. <laughs> and by feeling awful about yourself, you'll often find yourself in addiction or in any type of thing that's numbing that pain. I've worked with so many people with various addictions over the years, and always the common denominator is that they are the ones holding the most guilt in their life. And then what the guilt keeps them in the addiction because they just can't handle the pain. They can't, they don't want to feel the pain of, you know, doing that thing that whatever, facing the thing that led them into the addiction to begin with. But once you're in addiction, then you actually start hurting your life and then you hurt the people around you. You lose a lot, if, especially if you get lost in the addiction. It just becomes this perpetuated thing. But then you see, it goes back to holding space for the pain. But it's so much easier to hold space for the pain when you stop judging it and when you stop judging what you've done in the past. When you stop judging who you hurt or how you hurt yourself and you just come to the present moment and say, this is what life is right here, right now. And I can handle this life here right now, but I can't handle the past 40 fucking years all at once, but I can handle it today. And so that's where the, the, the releasing morality, releasing the duality really helps. Again, we don't say there's no morality, just go out and do fuck up, you know, stuff and hurt people. That's pain. We don't, we, don't preach, we don't preach causing yourself and other people pain. We preach causing yourself and other people peace through your own actions. So our moral compass, this is just a nice recap, is peace pain. That's all you need to worry about. Does my action lead to further suffering for myself and others, or does my actions lead to further peace for myself? And the irony is that leaning into your pain though it leads to more pain momentarily, it actually does lead to peace in the long run. And then we have the three attachments, which we already uh, mentioned, releasing our attachment to the mundane world, how we, thinks, how we think things should be, our attachments to having a certain amount of security, thinking that I can only be happy with X, Y, Z, yada, yada, yada. Then we have release our attachment to what we think we know. After a while, you've been studying this stuff, or maybe you've been in other traditions, and you think you know stuff. But the funny thing is, a lot of times knowing can block compassion because we know stuff and then we get frustrated that other people don't know it the same way. I'm sure all of you could relate to that where you're just like, you listen to other people's pain, you're just like, just snap the fuck out of it. <laughs> just do what I'm saying because you have an outside view and you can see their issue. But then you're going through the same thing in your own life in just a different way. And so they're probably thinking that you're just as crazy, you know, because we're all suffering in our own unique ways. We've all closed ourselves off in our own unique ways. And that is one of the most beautiful unifying factors of humanity is that because this world is impermanent, we all feel pain. And it's never about comparing one suffering to another person's suffering. It's literally just about hearing it. Ooh, let me tell you this bit. One of the biggest issues that keeps people from actually dropping into complete compassion is that especially when you're handled, especially in a parent and child relationship, when you're looking at someone and you think that their pain 
is not that bad. When you think that their suffering is all self-created and if they just stopped, then they'd be fine. Parents often do that to their children because their life, the kid's life is fine. You're just like, you're fine. Why are you doing this? Why are you acting out? But in actuality, we're all creating our suffering for ourselves. And it might be justified. We may have done some shit or experienced some shit in the past, but today it doesn't exist, but we re-invoke it. For kids, they're learning the power of their mind as teenagers, and they don't fully recognize how to control the direction of the thought streams and how the thought streams influence behavior. And so their pain is just as real as anyone else's. When they're in incredible depression, and you don't know why, and you just say, just it doesn't make sense why you're in this depression, and then we devalue it and we don't fully listen to them. It, we're, not, we're not holding space for them because we can't understand it, and we're not understanding it because we're caught up in our own perception that it's not that big of a deal. But it is a big of a deal because we're seeing on our planet, what, for whatever reason, an increase in teen suicide. And some of these teens actually had really decent lives, and there was not any abuse involved, but because of whatever was happening up here and the pressure of society and not feeling heard by their families, they just didn't want to be here anymore. And so that is the proof in the pudding about why it is so important to let, let go of our attachments to what we think we know and drop into just complete compassion and fully listening, dropping, letting go of our attachment to who we think we are and our identity and just listening and just listening and then listening and then asking, what do you need in this moment? And a lot of kids can't tell you. A lot of adults can't tell you because they don't, they're not used to thinking in that way. All they're used to is just their pain. And so then you just listen to some more and you say, well, I'm here when you're ready. Once you figure out what you need, let me know. Um, and even, even when I've worked with kids, sometimes it's very difficult to understand that because so often we're not used to thinking what our needs are because we're often told what our needs should be. Think about that for a moment. We're often told what we should be doing in life, how society expects us to behave. So we're not always used to actually thinking what our emotional needs are. We get caught up in the expectation of what other people think we should need. And then, of course, we move on to what we were already talking about today, which is release self. And I shared my story with you on how I had to release myself, which, again, was the rotating door, the mirror effect, and the empathy because if I was so attached to this idea of how a pastor should be or a Zen teacher, and I shouldn't have to deal with this shit because I'm just trying to help people. Why do I have to suffer along with you? <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to love and I don't understand. I, there was a couple years where I just couldn't understand where I'm just being kind and open hearted and letting people into my life. And then they just disappear without even a goodbye. It would snap my head in half trying to figure it out. But it wasn't my job to figure it out. It was just my job to accept it and to keep showing up and doing the work. And I kept showing up and here you are today, you lovely people, you lovely people. <laughs> and had I not, then think about how many people since that point would have not gotten these teachings. I may never have even written this book. And so it's fascinating how every single one of you in this room has a beautiful gift to share. But what's fascinating, and everyone listening at home, we all have these beautiful gifts to share, but because of pain, because of hurt, because of relationships, slowly but surely, hurt after hurt, we clam up just a little bit more. Every time we get hurt, it's almost like we close a little bit more, we close a little bit more, we close a little bit more, and we notice that the joy starts to go away with that closing. Because as kids, kids are pretty like just... I wasn't, but kids, <laughs> most kids are very joyful creatures and they bounce around and they're just kind of doing their thing in the present moment. But after they've experienced enough hurt, you slowly start to see that they just slowly close up. And that happened to me at a young age until I recognized it. And then we start to open up our hearts once again, once we become an adult. But many of us, our first relationship experience is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and so we close ourselves more up after that. And then we develop these negative expectations of reality and that it's, you know, we can't trust people or just what, whatever the story is. We all have a story with something. And our job is just to slowly but surely just put it down and be okay with the world being a bit painful. 
because the truth is this world is painful and it was designed to be painful because everything's impermanent. Nothing lasts forever, but it doesn't mean that you can't be joyous along with the pain. The main thing that keeps us from the joy with the pain is the suffering because when you have the mental and the emotions going with the physical aspect of loss and the physical aspect of pain, then it becomes very difficult to get out of that reality and to show up each and every day. Let's take a breath. I'll go ahead and end with this story. I didn't get to everything I wanted to get to, but that's okay. Um, it's the second, it's the second excerpt and it's just kind of a funny story. So much of our world's aggression and defensiveness occurs when people as individuals or groups take offense to things. In my early 20s, during the time I was an interfaith pastor, I started a Sunday sermon by giving my congregation the middle finger and saying, fuck you, in a very serious tone. Some laughed, some were confused or uncomfortable, while others noticed an irritation rise within them from the gesture. <coughs> then I blatantly said, if you were triggered by this in any way, we have work to do. <laughs> The purpose of my exercise was to show people that any offense taken is purely psychological and therefore is an illusion of our own making when we label certain things or actions dualistically right, wrong, and bad. We know this to be true because depending on one's culture, these words and gestures have completely different meanings. And so I love them. I'm just like, fuck you to everyone, even my grandparents, even my parents, you know, and it was probably a room of like 35, 40 people at the time. And it's true psychologically chosen wounded. They had a belief system about it and they psych psychologically agreed to feeling oh, about the situation. And every single time that any of us in this room are offended, we are psychologically agreeing to being offended in that situation. Anytime we're feeling any big, huge, consuming emotion, there's a part of us that have psychologically agreed to feeling that emotion. And what's beautiful is there's, even, there's been science done on this. And there, I posted on Facebook, for those of you on Facebook, watch the, watch the TED Talk. I, wa I posted this video of this woman who's a scientist. Um, she gave a 20-minute TED Talk on how emotions don't just happen to you. You create them over time. And so depending on the thoughts that you're thinking, you're developing these pathways and you're agreeing to these thoughts. And she calls them... Emotions are predictions on how you think you should be feeling in a situation based off of the past experience. So you've had past experiences and then you develop this belief system around what calls for a certain emotion. And then the next time it happens, you notice that you're now feeling that emotion based off of that previous addiction, how you think you should be behaving. And that's why a lot of emotional balance does come from environmental conditioning when you're being raised up. So it's so fascinating when you're a child and you see a parent always acting aggressively under stress and you're like, I will never behave that way. What's fascinating is that once that child becomes an adult and they see the parent, then, then they start feeling the stress of life or maybe they become a parent, their instant go-to is the previous prediction of how they should behave under stress because that's what they always saw. I have seen that happen constantly, even within my own life. When I got into a relationship for a first time in marriage, I'm like, oh my God, I'm my mother. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. But there was that, you know, there was that stress in how she handled conflict. And so I noticed that just because I saw it literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, it became a prediction. And I said, no more, you know, that's her karma. This is mine. So how, how is a lark going to show up? How is a lark going to now choose to start showing up under stress, under conflict? And then over time, after it happened a few more times, I just decided, you know, I'm just going to, I'm never going to yell again. I never really was a yeller. I'm never going to raise my voice or have a tone again. And I think for two years, I've consistently fully done that. Never raised my voice or had a tone in our marriage or even in any stressful situation. It was just agreed upon decision. Anyone who knows Bob Ross, the fro with the paint, you know, awesome guy. He was an army sergeant before he became a painter. And he made a vow. He, never, he hated making people feel bad about themselves by yelling at them. Because back then it was even worse, you know, in how the drill sergeants trained people. It softened over the years, but it was way worse back then. And he never, he said, I never want to raise my voice again. And so that's where he developed that soft tone. And he just wanted people to feel relaxed around him, even though his whole job previously was making people feel stressed and to motivate them 
multiplied through anger and aggression to get the shit done because it was a life and death situation. He had to train them so they wouldn't fuck off. And so that was his perception. And so he completely did a life shift. Isn't that beautiful? So these emotions that we're constantly feeling, if we recognize that they do start in the, in the mind, which I've been teaching for years, I, it's so cool to have it validated by science. <sighs> what great relief that is to know. But it's also scary because it comes with responsibility. We can't kind of blame it on just, well, this is just how I am. No, it's how I've kind of been conditioned to be. And now I'm aware of it and I can start reconditioning myself. So there you go. <laughs> A lot of little side rants, but I hope those of you attending today and those of you listening at home got at least one nugget of information out of it. Um, and even if not, I released myself again. <laughs> my old self would always feel awful. I'm like, oh God, I didn't do a great enough job and all these things. The stories of thinking that you could do a better job and not go on as many rants or whatever. And so in my practice, I'm learning to just put that down saying, you know what? I show up and do my best every day. Some days are better than others. Just as every single one of you here is in the same boat, you show up and do your best every single day. And some days are better than others. And it's all okay. At the end of the day, it's just about being kind and showing up and giving a little bit of peace and laughter with each other and just doing our work and doing it well. And at the end of the day, we rest. The next day, doing our work, doing it well. And at the end of the day, we rest. Thanks and repeat. So... Thank you all. I'll go ahead and focus in on the YouTubers right now. As always, there's links down below if you want to work one-on-one -on -one together. And you can always just send me a note and just say, hey, Lark, I have this idea of I want to work with you, but I really don't know what, what direction to go in. You can kind of just send me a paragraph or two, and then I can kind of send you up a quote on how that would look and what the cost would be since I can personalize packages as well. And as always, I appreciate, appreciate, appreciate donations down below. We have gotten some through the online forum. And because of it, I'm going to get a new microphone because I keep getting feedback that this is not doing the job. And so, you know, your donations really do help. And hopefully we'll get uh, video cameras are much more expensive. And so I'd like to kind of get a better camera at some point, too. So thank you for your donations for that. So as always, I will see you all next week and have a happy, happy.